Hi, I'm um, John Novembre. I'm at the University of Chicago, um, and I'll be talking about understanding geographic structure and genetic variation data today. So, um, population structure is a fundamental feature of uh, biological species, and um, it can be conceptualized in, in several different ways. And these are some of the classical ways that. Uh, uh, population genomes have thought of it. So it's, it's really the existence of non-random mating due to subpopulations with restricted dispersal. So one form is to think about a set of islands that are all exchanging migrants with one another in a completely unstructured way uh, in, in terms of the migration being equal to every other island. Or at the other extreme, these stepping stone type models. So this is, um, is named after the stepping stones in Japanese gardens where Populations are arranged along a chain with uh, each stone representing a population and is exchanging migrants with its neighbors. The two-dimensional version of this would be like a square lattice, which each of these being a subpopulation exchanging migrants with its neighbors. And you can take the limit of this as population sizes get very small and the, sp inters the spacing gets uh, between um, them gets small where this is a kind of continuum where just po individuals are living along a continuum and there's this continuous uh, isolation by distance, we say, um, where individuals tend to mate with their near geographic neighbors. Um, we can also have what's co sometimes called the vicariance model, where there's an ancestral population that has a vicariance event. It splits into two daughter populations. Um, this is sometimes called the pants model in population genetics because it's like uh, it, when drawn a certain way, it looks like a pair of pants with the, the waist and then two legs going down. Um, or you can have uh, individuals who have their ancestry from multiple source populations. Uh, in that case, those individuals are called admixed, and these are admixture models. Uh, so there are many different conceptualizations and, and many different tools for exploring population structure. So this is one of the most popular, uh, the output from one of the most popular uh, branch of methods, methods that do admixture proportion inference. So for example, the program structure or admixture. And um, these work within that admixture view of population structure where each individual has their ancestry from different source populations. And I'll, I'll say more about these in a minute. Um, there are ordination type methods where individuals are displayed in, in continuous axes that represent their overall genetic similarity. Um, so the main popular approaches are PCA, although there's methods like SPA that were developed here. Uh, um, uh, tree mix is a tree-based model, uh, so that's another category of approaches that's taken where a tree is used to reconstruct how populations are related to one another, and in the most recent versions of these, there are now uh, edges added on top of the tree to really make it more like a network that represent uh, uh, gene flow events or migration contacts that have taken place after initial divergences. Um, so many different ways of studying population structure. It's a, a, a broad interest for evolutionary biologists, conservation geneticists, um, ecologists, um, and for um, genetic medicine and, and disease uh, and complex trait genetics because um, it, population structure can confound naive genome-wide association studies. So uh, genome-wide association studies are a really important area of research where uh, one uh, does a, a linear model of the phenotype against uh, the SNP effect, so testing each and every SNP in a, um, in a, across some large panel of SNPs and asking whether there's an association between the SNP and the phenotype, and this is a plot of the negative log 10 p-value, and hopefully you get these um, spikes that indicate that there is something in that region that is associated with the phenotype. Okay, a problem with these approaches, though, uh, if done naively, is that if instead of the phenotype being determined by a particular SNP, it's determined by some variable that tracks with population membership, like an environmental factor or a general genetic background, then when you fit this linear model, if the SNP co-varies with population membership, it can stand in for that possibly non-genetic factor, and you get a false positive. Okay, so um, uh, so that's the problem of, of, of population stratification and confounding and genome-wide association studies and why there's a lot of attention to methods to study population structure and, and correct for it. So um, this is more of a tutorial talk, so I am going to be giving an introduction to fixation indices, FST. It's a number that population geneticists use to describe how much differentiation there is within a data set. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to talk about structure models in PCA uh, and connect them in a unifying framework uh, as uh, two forms of factor analysis. I'm going to discuss some noteworthy behaviors of PCA. Um, and then I'll talk about effective migration surfaces briefly. This is a new kind of research aspect of the talk um, before finishing. So, um, okay, so this is a figure that I now um, show that we actually generate as part of a, a workshop that we do with incoming students. Um, uh, it's one of these like intro to grad school um, computational biology boot camps. And, I have the students plot something very simple, genotype proportions versus allele frequencies, okay? And so the colors represent, from SNP data, so the colors represent, uh, here these are the proportions of little a, little a genotypes as a function of frequency, okay, in the data set. So for you calculate for each SNP an allele frequency, for each SNP the three different genotype proportions, okay, how many little a, little a, big A, little a, and big A, big A genotypes you have, and then plot the three genotype proportions, you know, vertically below where the allele frequency was, okay? And uh, what you see in SNP data from, this is human data from populations across the globe, is this extreme regularity. There's a relationship between genotype proportion and allele frequency. It's as if there's some underlying law of nature governing this, right? And um, so, uh, Ask students, okay, let's empirically figure out what that law might be. Let's think about it. Oh, this looks kind of like a quadratic. Uh, this is like a it crosses at 0.25 when you go about 0.5. Oh, it kind of looks like um, if this frequency of the A allele were P, this looks like the line P squared, right? Okay, so that's like an empirical law we could derive about genotype proportions relating to allele frequencies. Um, and uh, then we can say, well, that's an empirical law. Can we bring a theory behind why that law might be true, okay? And what would be uh, a basic theory of that would generate that empirical law? Does anybody have any ideas? It, yeah, independence, random mating. This idea that if, if the alleles are actually independent draws from this underlying allele frequency, they should be appearing at like P times P, P squared, right, would be the, the rate at which you would see this particular um, configuration. So then we, you know, uh, um, and so that is the law that is the Hardy-Weinberg law that you uh, learn. Typically, it's learned the, the other direction, right? You learn the law, you're told that it has all these conditions to make it work. This is the other way. Start with the data, you see it just emerges. Um, okay, so these are the lines for the Hardy-Weinberg proportions, P squared, uh, 1 minus P squared, 2 PQ. They're the, they're the, what emerges if we assume the alleles at each, the alleles are independent um, in how they're uh, assembled into genotypes, okay? So I, I, actually, I want you to think about, because we're more statistical audience, that Hardy-Weinberg means the, yeah, the independence of alleles within genotypes. And um, you see human data actually departs from it slightly, okay? So um, in what way is it departing? It looks like the homozygotes are a little more abundant than you would expect under pure Hardy-Weinberg. The heterozygotes are a little less abundant, okay? So um, this doesn't look like perfect independence, right? it looks like some kind of uh, correlation is happening, right? That the big A allele tends to be found with another big A allele. The little A allele tends to be found with another little A allele, so they, that ups the rate of those two um, configurations. So um, uh, we can think about this more generally, the correlation of alleles within a genotype, and that's what F measures in population genetics is, um, uh, that's related to FST, I'll get to in a second. So if you put an indicator variable for each of the alleles inherited at the maternal and paternal, um, uh, for the maternal and paternal alleles, okay, um, an indicator variable, and then we talk about the correlation of that indicator variable and uh, label it F, then F is this useful number for us in describing how far uh, populations depart from Hardy-Weinberg. So this is the data you just saw from global populations and this departure where we have an excess of homozygotes corresponds to a correlation between the alleles of about 10%, okay? This is data from just uh, zooming in within Europe, and, um, and you see that the correlation is lower. It's 0 0.003, okay? So why might alleles be correlated when we look at data at a global level and not correlated when we zoom into one part of the globe? 
population structure, okay? That at the level of the globe, if I find an individual is carrying one allele, then their, you know, their mother gave them one allele, their father's more likely to have given them that allele because it's sort of geographically clustered, right, in that part of the world. Um, uh, knowing that the mother as an A says, oh, that, that means you're like from some part of the world where A is common. Your father probably is from that, also from that part of the world, would also give you that. So it creates this positive correlation. And, um, oops, whoa, 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 whoa. A, um, which results in, yeah, an excess of homozygotes, a deficiency of heterozygotes. Classically, this deficiency of heterozygotes has been recognized as a signature of population subdivision. It's called the Volland effect, okay? Okay, so this F, um, yeah, measures the correlation. Um, it can arise for reasons besides population structure. It could be that individuals are inbred, okay? That, like, the, you know, the big A's are paired with big A's because mothers tend to marry their cousins, and that would lead to an excess of the, the, the coupling of these alleles. Um, the fact that this signal disappears when you focus on one part of the world suggests that it's population structure, right, and not inbreeding. Um, to deal with this, that there are kind of different reasons for why the correlation can arise, you can actually partition the correlation into components, and that's what population geneticists do. Okay, and um, where this um, correlation F, it can be decomposed into different parts. So if you have subpopulation labels, so you know where everyone's from, then you can break it into the correlation of alleles sampled from an individual within a subpopulation, and this would be things that, such as inbreeding that would cause this to be this F to be non-zero. And then you have the correlation of alleles sampled randomly within a subpopulation. That's FST, okay? And then F is for individuals observed in the total population. This is the, the, the unannotated F is usually this one. And in this framework, it's labeled FIT. So you have this individuals relative to the total, individuals relative to the subpopulation, subpopulation relative to the total. This is kind of what's going on there. Um, okay, so... Uh, yeah, in practice in humans, the, the effects of inbreeding are generally pretty low. If you just measure F in, in your sample, you're usually getting kind of at FST. So that's why when I showed that graph and I said the F is 10%, that aligns with the fact that if we calculate FST for human populations, it's about 10% globally, okay? So um, that fact that like human alleles at the global level are only correlated at a level of 10% is, that's pretty weak. Like it's, it's a sign of weak population structure. It's a sign that we have rapidly spread out across the globe and uh, as part of our out of Africa um, history. Okay. So this F uh, provides a tool for detecting general deviations from random mating hardy weinberg conditions even without subpopulation labels. If you have subpopulation labels, you can calculate specifically FST and quantify just how strong that population structure is by, by um, that number reflecting the correlation, okay? Um, it's a fundamental quantity in population genetics. It's directly related to inbreeding coefficients and pedigrees, to the broader theory of fixation indices that Sewell Wright worked out, to probabilities of identity by descent, whether two copies of an allele trace back to a common ancestor or not, that's the ideas of Gustav Malico, to pairwise coalescent times, which are how long we have to go back to find a common ancestor, um, and also to the proportion of variance observed between subpopulations when you do an ANOVA-like analyses um, with population structure. Okay, so it's this, it's this thing you see in many places. I want to give a, a, an introduction to it briefly. All right. Um, in practice, when you estimate FST, there are some subtleties, especially when sample sizes are small and rare variants are present. And there are a few recent papers that, are, that, that um, I, I recommend for getting into that. But I want to keep us moving along. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about admixture proportion inference now and then ordination methods. So the basic input matrix for when you're studying population structure is this matrix of um, individuals by SNPs where the genotypes get coded as 0, 1, 2 variables, and you end up with an a n by p matrix of n individuals p SNPs. Okay. And admix proportion inference takes that matrix, and it uh, tries to infer for each individual 
a vector of ancestry proportions where those proportions reflect how much of each individual's genome can be modeled as coming from one of uh, K source populations. So in this cartoon here, there are four source populations. Each individual has some proportion of their ancestry from these sources. So this individual's like 40% from this population, this and uh, sorry, 40% say from this population, 60 from that one, and so on and so forth for other individuals. So we have this vector Q of ancestry proportions of length K per individual, and the underlying principle for inferring that is to model the genotypes as um, being drawn from these source populations with the given ancestry proportions and assuming the independence of alleles within genotypes. Okay? And so in a way, it's looking for a set of allele frequencies in the source populations and ancestry proportions in the study individuals that look, that kind of create the most tardy wine that like kind of fit that independence most well, okay? And um, the original approach was developed in the software structure. That's an MCMC approach um, in a Bayesian context has over 10,000 citations. There, this proved to be too slow for large-scale SNP data, and so there have been a, a number of different variant approaches have been developed over the years, including FRAP-A, which is an EM approach, Admixture, which was developed here, that uses um, kind of direct optimization of the likelihood, does local gradients and, and um, a kind of gradient ascent with uh, like acceleration to the steps, um, and fast structure, which is a variational Bayes approach. Um, I'm recommending some reviews here that I've actually written recently on, on uh, one is a perspective piece on the fast structure paper. The other is a kind of historical perspective um, for one of the anniversary editions of genetics on the original structure paper. One side comment on that is in writing this history piece about the structure paper, um, uh, in, in that I'm going to tell the story about um, how um, the three authors met at a conference, and um, Stephen, or Pritchard was on his way to be a postdoc with Donnelly. Stevens was there, and they talked about the basic ideas of structure and sketched out the model. And it was only a few weeks later where the first implementation was done. Um, so it kind of shows you the value of these small meetings where you get the right people in the room to spend a little time jamming out and you know, brainstorming ideas. And then years later, there's you know papers with <laughs> ten thousand citations. So we can only hope that this CGSI is so productive. Um, and uh, yeah, don't the founders of that uh, conference wish that they had in the acknowledgments section <laughs> they've been uh, acknowledged? So um, okay, so. Uh, Okay, but an interesting thing is you can think of this as factor analysis. So in the actual admixture model, the, the original structure model, there's a latent variable for the ancestry of each allele copy. You can sum over that latent variable in this kind of, um, sort of like Dave was talking about, like, like the kind of collapsing that you do for stands that you remove that discrete variable. And, um, and then the model becomes a GIJ is a binomial size 2. Uh, samples from an underlying um, success probability that's RIJ, where the RIJ is a sum over the admixture proportion of the ith individual in the kth population and the frequency in the kth population of the jth allele. Okay. And um, so this uh, um, can be expressed as a matrix multiplication where you have the Q matrix that's n by k of admixture proportions and a P matrix that's K by P, that's a collection of all the allele frequencies, okay? So uh, this can be seen as a special case of factor analysis with K factors. The idea of factor analysis is that you're taking like the genotype matrix and, multi and, and expressing it as the product of two matrices, um, one that's N by K and one that's K by P. Okay, um, but it's factor analysis with specific constraints. The constraints that the rows of lambda um, sum to one because their ancestry proportions they have to sum to one, and the rows of f, the allele frequencies, their allele frequencies they have to sum to one. Okay, um, and uh, this this interpretation is is laid out in a paper by Engelhart and Stevens in 2010. Okay. Now, another major approach that's popular for studying population structure is principal components. Um, I'll go quickly through this because many are familiar with it. It's the idea that you have this multidimensional data um, that's in some dimension P, and then uh, we can think of taking um, 
the axes that run through the directions of largest variation in this p-dimensional space, and then projecting our data down onto a, a subset of those um, principal components. Okay, and so uh, uh, after you know, kind of, uh, we can make this PC1, PC2 projecting onto that as kind of a rotation of the data, and now this represents the largest axis of variation, and then the next least next most largest axis of variation. When applied to um, SNP data, you might say, well, wait, SNP data is like, uh, you know, categorical. There are three different genotypes. But uh, what's done in practice is to convert the genotypes into um, uh, numerically ordered uh, values. So we can just count the number of some reference allele, so here the big A allele, and make this coding of 0, 1, and 2, and then um, have uh, the SNP genotype matrix then just become a matrix where uh, it's 0, 1s, and 2s marking the genotypes. Um, and now it's numerical, and we can run PCA on it. Okay? Typically, there's a, some normalization done to make this uh, mean-centered and, um, uh, and have the standard vi variation of the columns all be uh, equal and set to 1. Um, but then PCA can be run on this matrix. Uh, for each individual, we can get their projections onto the PCs. Um, so, uh, you know, squishing it down from P dimensions to some smaller set of K dimensions, here just two, and then we can plot, this is what's done in practice, is plot individuals, uh, their projections onto PC1 and 2. And this was simulated data, so I, I, it's actually nice. It turns out, as, one, I, as I expected, I simulated two source populations <laughs> with a set of admixed individuals. And you see those two source populations, and the admixed individuals come out. They were 50-50 admixed. They come out about 50-50 between the two source populations. So this has um, been uh, you know, argued to be a, a, a nice way to represent population structure. Um, and, uh, and that's elaborated on um, by Alcus Price's paper in 2006, was the first one to kind of pull it into the GWAS literature. Um, Nick Patterson wrote more about um, uh, some of its properties. Um, and I'll say even uh, more about some of these papers in a second. So um, there are different methods to compute PCA. Um, one is using eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So I'm also going to go quickly through this, because I think most people are familiar with this. Um, you can also get to PCA doing singular value uh, decomposition. So um, here in the singular value decomposition, the matrix U that's n by n gives the um, projections or loadings of the individuals. And then the um, uh, V gives the actual definitions of the principal components. Um, and S is giving the eigenvalues. Okay. So um, if there's a probabilistic formulation of PCA, where um, the XIJ, so that's the, actually the genotype matrix in our case, is multivariate normal with um, a uh, mean that is, uh, or I guess for each XIJ, that's just, a, it's not, this is just normal. Uh, sorry. So is just um, given by the ijth element of this um, uh, product of matrices and with a residual variance term. And then this matrix is the n by k loadings. And this is a k by p factor. So you have k factors and the loadings. And these are constrained to be orthogonal. These are constrained to be orthonormal. So um, when you do PCA, it is the, these two matrices are given by the results of a standard PCA. Okay, where um, U is the um, uh, the M by K, the how each individual projects onto the K factors, and the SVT in the single value decomposition representation is the K by P, like the K factors, um, and they're and how they're defined. Um, so, uh, going back to this factor analysis interpretation now. Admixture, the structure model, you can interpret as a factor analysis with particular constraints. Um, and the PCA model is also factor analysis, where we're, you know, we have this um, expression for the original matrix in terms of um, uh, products of, uh, of two matrices with an inner you know, um, uh, K factors, but with a different set of constraints. So they're connected to each other deeply. Okay. Um, here's an application of PCA that, um, that uh, 
I was able to do with um, a great collaboration with um, the PopRes data, which is data generated by GlaxoSmithKline um, from individuals mainly sampled in London and Lausanne and who reported all of their geographic, uh, like information about their geographic ancestry and their uh, grandparental geographic ancestry. So these are individuals whose grandparents showed a single origin and then they're labeled by that origin. And this is a legend. Uh, each of these two letter codes is a single individual the legend for those two letter codes is here. And what you see is the PCA of the genetic data strongly reflects the geography of Europe, okay? Where you have Spain, Portugal, France, Switzerland, et cetera, kind of moving through here. Hopefully you're seeing the similarity. Um, the proportion of variation explained in this is 0.3% of the variation on PC1, 0.15% on PC2, okay? Very low levels of variation stratify along these axes. This goes back to that, um, you know, I was showing you how well does the, um, does the data for Europe fit uh, the Hardy-Weinberg proportions, and uh, the F value was 0.003. Um, so um, uh, it's very close to random mating, and in that way, it's also that the, these PCs don't reflect deep structure. They're very low levels of variation um, explained along these axes. Those are, uh, these are based off the eigenvalues, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so you can zoom in even within Switzerland and see um, uh, that uh, French-speaking Swiss, German-speaking Swiss, and Italian-speaking Swiss kind of shift in the directions of French, Germany, and Italy, okay? That this kind of structure is resolvable, is really um, astounding given, uh, as I showed in those earlier slides, just how, like, from one perspective, uh, Europe looks like a completely randomating population, okay? But it's that power of big data that we have so many loci that we can look over, that we can detect subtle, there's a, there's a subtle structure in the, in the, in the, um, uh, um, in the um, covariance matrix amongst the individuals, okay? Now, some comments are that choosing the number of latent factors is, um, in any of these approaches, a key challenge. So in structure, admixture, that plays out as knowing the number of K ancestral populations to use when you fit the model. In PCA, it means the number of components to, <coughs> to plot or to explore. Um, and in both cases are procedures that exist to try to choose a sensible value of K, but um, most of those are a, a bit unstable, and so in general, the recommendation in the field is to uh, view this as exploratory analysis and to evaluate the impact of K um, and, and look across different values of, of, of K, okay? Um, and this factor analysis interpretation uh, is useful because it suggests possible alternative approaches with different advantages. So sparse factor analysis is, is an approach that Engelhardt and Stevens took where they um, impose uh, priors that encourage sparseness in the solutions for the factors. Um, in uh, work that was done here um, with Iran and Eleazar, um, there's a, um, uh, so the SPA model is a kind of factor analysis with two latent factors and a logistic link. Um, how it all developed this logistic factor analysis. Um, Eric Frischot and colleagues have um, used uh, non-negative matrix factorization to do a, a, another approach for viewing population structure. Um, okay, so I need to get plugged in. The, an interesting feature of, uh, so now I'm shifting to talking about some behavior of PCA. Um, and, uh, yeah. I think Bogdan's uh, were discussing yesterday that you know, using some of these methods like fate, which caps for local and global structure in two dimensions, may also be interesting. Has anyone tried like uh, some of these compression techniques in the two dimensions? Yeah, um, <coughs> there. Um, there's none that I know of that have really like caught traction and like picked up. And and to what extent that's because they're either not getting into the right hands or being you know shown or it just the work isn't being done. I, I don't know, but it it, it is a, is a great um, question. I encourage that's the kind of the breadth of communities here. That's um, something I encourage uh, people to do more of. I'll show you some of the directions that we're going in that sort of are are a little bit different. So that's but um, okay. So. Uh, one thing is that PCA has this phase change for detecting structure, and this seems to be actually a feature not just of PCA, but uh, you know, now that we have this idea that you know, they're all factor analyses, maybe that, that uh, it'll show up in other approaches as well. 
but uh, it's been worked out in terms of like the theory of it a little more in the realm of PCA. The idea is that as we increase either the number of markers or the, our sample size um, that above a certain threshold that's related to the FST value between the two populations, then the structure in that data set will become apparent. And below that, it sort of collapses. So this is negative log 10 p values of uh, basically an, an ANOVA analysis on the, on the principal component um, loadings of individuals from two populations. And, um, and once the uh, data size be gets larger than the FST values, you start to see the signature below that you don't at all. So that's from this paper by Patterson and Reich. This is from a paper by Gil McVean where, yeah, as you increase the number of SNPs, things become apparent that previously weren't. So, um, and so this gets to the point, like, the levels of correlation of alleles can be very low. The absolute level structure can be very small. But as you get larger and larger sample sizes, it becomes meaningful to actually be able to detect and distinguish that structure. And um, there's some... Uh, uh, the math behind this that Patterson and Reich work out is related to this BBP threshold for a phase transition in the largest eigenvalue for um, uh, sample covariance matrices. So there's some cool work being done in like random matrix theory and covariance matrix theory that, that is helping explain these phase changes. Another important um, thing to realize with doing PCA is that um, when structure is weak, uh, in the sense of like population structure, then like genomic structure can actually be an attractor for the PCA. So if you have a large set of SNPs that are all acting in the same way, the, the factors can actually just explain those specific regions of the genome. So this is PC3 on the European PAPRES data uh, using 200,000 SNPs, even doing some filtering for LD. Um, uh, for how like SNPs are related to one another along a chromosome, you will still get like these PCs that load very heavily on particular uh, regions of the genome. And this is loading on chromosome 8, this one on chromosome 17. There are large polymorphic inversions <coughs> in those regions that kind of create a situation such that a large set of SNPs all like carry similar uh, genotypes. So it's long range LD. And after you... <laughs> And so one, one thing to do with, with in doing like really rigorous analyses is to run the PCA, look at the loadings, how the factors are defined, because they're, they're a linear combination of all the SNPs. If they're loading on a few regions of the genome, that's not going to re represent like global structure and how individuals are related to another. It's going to represent just what their genotypes are like at those positions in the genome. So then filter out uh, you know, a megabase around each of these peaks and then rerun and then you can get something where it's much more dispersed in terms of the loading. So that's something that we do in practice and, 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 is, and is done for the European map data. Okay, so um, time management. Uh, do you guys want more tutorial or more research for the last 10 minutes? Research, yeah. Okay, so um, I'll quickly go through this and then hit that. So there's a question. I've shown you what happens with discrete populations. With PCA, you get discrete clusters. If there's some kind of spatial continuity, really funny things happen. So this is PCA on, a, on data from a line. You get this horseshoe shape for PC1 versus PC2. Two versus three, you get this fish shape. Three versus four, you get this pretzel shape. Totally bizarre, right? It turns out like there's connection to these Lisa Zhu figures from old days. Uh, that really what you have is sinusoidal functions of space, okay? And um, is what the, the PCs end up being, and there's a bunch of theory around it. Has implications for like historical papers and population genetics. There have been papers about like interpreting these gradients in maps of PC values across space as evidence of expansions, that this is like, these are PC1 values for populations across Europe, and they decay as you move northwest to southeast. This was thought to be a signature of the expansion of farmers. This was interpreted as an expansion of people from the steppe coming into Europe. These, because of that same theory, you get gradients in principal component values, even if there's no directional migration. Um, and so these are eight simulation replicates where every one of them has <laughs> perpendicular gradients, just like in this, these results for Europe. So these, these 
properties of PCA can lead to very structured patterns that look maybe like directional signals, but really they're just a property of, of how when you have a spatial signal and you apply PCA, you'll get uh, these gradients for the first PCs and then increasing sinusoidal functions after that. So, okay, so here's the research part. Um, so when, with this PCA map, after we publish, people say, oh, well, is that the Pyrenees there, that little gap, you know, between France and Spain? Is that the English Channel somehow? You know, is that the Adriatic Sea? You know, are, and, you know, is somehow like Scandinavia squished in with, um, with the British Isles in a way that might be like gene flow across the North Sea from the Vikings? And we're very sensitive about doing that, because, about trying to like make those claims because um, PCA is a bit sensitive to your, your, how your sample density is distributed. So um, these are five Italian individuals that turn out to be Sardinian, okay, these five guys here. If we oversample, as a demonstration, oversample Sardinians, this is what happens, okay? These are 500 Sardinians added to the plot. It totally distorts the picture, okay? So the worry is that some of these things are because, well, maybe we've like sampled lots of Italians, so it's stretching this out, and maybe not enough Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, so it kind of pushes them together. We can't be too certain um, if we have a method like PCA that is really trying to explain the variance in the sample, not in like the population, right? So it can be really be distorted by uneven sample sizes. Gil McVean's paper um, from 2009 explores this as well. And so it motivated us to develop a new method that would use the geographical information of the samples that we have to help us recognize, oh, we have sampled a lot of this population and not a lot of that other one then adjust for the uneven sampling, and then still provide some insight to the genetic relationships amongst the samples. That method that we've developed is called EAMS. Um, it's a project that started when I was first at UChicago, and then Desi Petkova picked it up, and then um, it's finished and published in 2016. And so um, Desi did a fantastic job with this. This is the idea, is that we're going to um, take our samples that have a geographic locations, we have genetic data on the individuals, and we want to return, as a summary of the population structure, a map that shows regions where like, individuals are very similar to one another by having like blue. So this is showing these individuals are all uh, very highly related to one another given their geographic distance. Then this brown is showing that like if we go across this, that like individuals from here to here are very different from one another given their geographic distance. The idea is it's a, a migration surface, right? So it's like, what would the migration rates be that would explain the levels of similarity we see relative to geography? This thing is really capturing what in our input data, this is elephant data, where there are forest elephants and savanna elephants. So it's marking out that there is a boundary between the forest and savanna elephants. And then it's showing us that the savanna elephants who can move very easily across the savanna are pretty similar to one another given the, the geographic distances, okay? Under the hood, this uses a, um, a uh, discrete lattice model of how, where each of these edge nodes is a population, each of the edges represents uh, a migration edge. And if you give us migration rates and deem sizes, like what are the subpopulation sizes, okay, so we're coloring in all of the edges to give them weights, those imply pairwise coalescent times, okay, so there's theory of random walks of like how each of the ants, so coalescent times is thinking for two pieces of DNA, if we go back in time, uh, where was their common ancestor? To solve that requires thinking about like random walks on graphs to when they are in the same node and then when they actually within that node have a coalescence. So, you, so given this graph with the weighted edges, you can get pairwise coalescent times. That directly translates to expected genetic dissimilarity because if you've, it's a long time back to a common ancestor, then you'll be more dissimilar to if you only have a short time. And so um, we have expected genetic dissimilarity. We have observed genetic dissimilarity. So the idea is we need to fiddle with the migration rates and population sizes until we get expected values that are closely observed <coughs> ones. And the way we do this formally is with a Markov chain Monte Carlo um, that's exploring different um, uh, sets of migration rates over space and population sizes over space and then returns these smoothed maps 
that represent the posterior uh, mean migration rate. Okay. Um, this, uh, under the hood, calculating the pairwise coalescent times exactly is actually computationally costly. So we use this approximation based on res something called resistance distances, which um, are an idea that was developed by Brad McRae. He was an electrical engineer who, got, who wanted to do something more meaningful with his life, changed into conservation biology and genetics. And <laughs> For him personally, we all have our own value sets. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> and um, and he realized that the kind of math that electrical engineers use in terms of like looking at resistance and resistor networks could actually be used to explain genetic variation data in like large um, complex habitats, and so um, so. Uh, yeah, so there's this notion of resistance distance that's the effective resistance between two points, and it averages over all possible paths that the current can flow, which is how genetic uh, similarity works, that you have to average over all the paths that the common ancestors could have took. So it turns out to be a good approximation, and it's much faster to compute than using coalescent times. So we use this. Um, I also want to kind of just <coughs> recognize Brad. He was a friend of mine. He passed away last year. Um, and uh, and um, but uh, it's amazing the like impact he had uh, while he's here. He ended up then moving to the Nature Conservancy, and a lot of Nature Conservancy planning uses these ideas of like, should we buy this piece of land because it will connect these areas? And calculating those resistance distances, averaging over all the possible paths that animals can move on a landscape, it can, ends up being really really useful. So um, yeah, so we've developed this approach. Um, it, it can, like, if you feed it a flat map in simulations of, like, uniform migration, it returns that. If you feed it, like, north-south barrier, it will return that. Um, whereas, like, PCA, even if the sampling is, is, is clustered on, so here sampling is kind of rich on each of these two ends. So PCA will return two clusters because it doesn't recognize that you didn't undersample the middle. Uh, so you get two clusters in either case. But Eames is sort of recognizing that um, correcting for, you know, it knows the sample location, so it can correct for that and recognize that these two scenarios are different. Okay. So we've been applying it. Um, and this is my postdoc, Ben Peters, assembled these large data sets, been applying this approach. And man, this is uh, really like, touchy. Um, and this is an example of the output of applying it to human data from across the globe. So you see right away features like the Sahara, the Mediterranean, um, the Red Sea, uh, areas of, of low gene flow around the uh, Himalaya, uh, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Ural Mountains. So like major mountain ranges are popping up left and right, the Altai Mountains. Um, the Ongi are very isolated population and get low gene flow around them. Uh, so you see lots of features that kind of make sense. Um, and uh, it's a little, you know, it's tricky because this is just the posterior mean. So these are representations, sorry, with all population labels of like where you confidently have like 95% of the posterior supporting like below average migration. These are representations of the variance. So if I had more time, I'd sort of talk about, you know, these are challenging uh, uh, ways of like how do you represent uncertainty when you have these kind of complex representations. But when it comes to Europe, uh, we do infer the Adriatic as low gene flow. There's a little bit of a feature around the English Channel. Um, given, you know, like, like the Adriatic shows that low gene flow, the Mediterranean does, like the Black Sea through the Bosphorus does, the North Sea actually looks relatively mild. And then like Iceland to Scandinavia is really high gene flow because that makes sense. There's like that movement was very recent. And so f for that geographic distance, these people are very similar to one another. So this is a way of like understanding features in the data that wouldn't make themselves very apparent or that one could be confident about using PCA data. And this is like a PCA of the same, uh, just the first two PCs of the same data. You know, it would be a lot harder to kind of make out a lot of these relationships just using you know something like, like this, right? So um, uh, I should wrap up, but we, yeah, we we are. Um, so I'll just go to open challenges. Um, you know, methods that scale to contemporary data and population structure, that's a major issue. So getting to hundreds of thousands of samples is a big challenge, though there's kind of continual innovation. So fast PCA is one approach that can now do PCA at very large scale. 
Um, a big challenge is handling sparse observations in ancient DNA data, where you have like really patchy observations of genotypes. How do you fit those individuals into PCA uh, type approaches nicely? Um, so there's different approaches being taken there. All the approaches I've been talking about are treating genotypes independently. Um, how do you leverage the haplotype structure um, that we were introduced so well on the first day? So there are some approaches using uh, this approach called fine structure um, and using identity by descent. Um, you know, how do we visualize large numbers of factors or subpopulations? Um, how do we deal with uh, hierarchical structure with more flexible alternatives and trees? And an ultimate goal that we think is exciting is trying to make these maps of migration rates and population sizes through time, um, including cases of asymmetric and long-range migration. So these are some of the limitations that you know, Eames has right now. It's one map. It doesn't do like long-range migration. It doesn't do asymmetric migration. But if we could do all that, it would be amazing, though, though challenging. So, um, so I think, yeah, Brad, again, for that, you know, the innovation of this resistance distance. The Eames team is um, Ben, a postdoc, Hussein, a student working on uh, extensions, Desi, who did the, the uh, lead work in developing it out, and Matthew, um, <coughs> key collaborator on it. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. And sorry for running a little late. <laughs>